Humane Marketers, welcome back and welcome to season one of the new Humane Marketing Podcast, the place for the generation that cares. This is the show where we talk about running your business in a way that feels good to you, is aligned with your values and also resonates with today's conscious customers because it's humane, ethical and non-pushy. I'm Sarah Zanacroce, I'm the host here, and you're listening to episode 100. Yes, even though this is the first episode under the new name, I want to keep the count and continue on where we left off with the Gentle Business Revolution podcast. So you know that you're in the right place if you are a heart-centered entrepreneur or change maker who is looking for a different, a better way to market your business. Or you might also be a marketing impact pioneer, someone that's working for an organization who does business for good and who's looking to align your company's marketing with the rest of your values. If you're a regular here, welcome back. I'm so glad you're here. You know that I'm organizing the conversations around the seven Ps of the now called humane marketing mandala. And if you're new here and don't know what I'm talking about, you can download your one-page marketing plan with the humane marketing version of the seven Ps at humane.marketing forward slash one page. And this comes with seven email prompts to really help you reflect on these different P's for your business. So today's conversation fits under the first P, the P of passion. And I'm talking to Scott Poyton, an Australian lad based here in Switzerland, kind of in my neck of the woods. And he, um, he and I actually met first online through a common friend of ours, Olivia. And then earlier this summer, we met in person here in Switzerland. It's always great to, you know, be able to meet people in real life, both of us. us, uh, Did we wear masks? No, I think we, uh, we were outside on a terrace, so we didn't have to wear masks. So it it was really good to meet uh, Scott in real life. So let me read his official bio. Scott Poynton is an Australian forester who has spent his life supporting people to navigate often challenging journeys to a different way of living, working, and generally being in the world. This has included mediating disputes between some of the world's largest companies and NGO organizations focused on helping protect forests and other ecosystems and to support human rights. His work has led to the protection of millions of hectares of forest and today he works to share the lessons from these processes as broadly as possible so that others can support their own change journeys. I'm featuring this conversation under the P of passion because first of all Scott just truly strikes me as a passionate person, but also because the work Scott is doing now is really helping people who are lost find their passion back. So today we talk about a different way and what that means to Scott and also what it means to me, the importance of reconnecting with nature to find our way back to passion and why nature does have such a calming effect on us. Scott explains how he helped big world leaders by just listening and often in the process getting yelled at sometimes. He also explains to us uh, this image that he has on his website with a man or a person praying to a duck and what the meaning behind this is. And then also, you know, why all of this matters for us entrepreneurs, why passion matters but more importantly, why it matters that you find uh, the way back to yourself and really show up as yourself in the world. So without further ado, here's my lovely conversation with Scott. Hey, Scott, so good to see you, talk to you. Yeah, hi, Sarah. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, this time not in real life, but almost. <laughs> yeah, like I, becoming real life, doesn't it? We do so it, many of the 
tolls. It does. Yeah, it does. So excited to talk to you. And as I mentioned in the intro that I read for the podcast, I organize these conversations around the seven Ps of humane marketing. And yours, I just felt like, you know, naturally it fit under passion because to me, you're just, you're just such a passionate guy. And so I wanted to kind of highlight that and, and then also talk about this idea of passion and purpose and all of that. So I think the obvious question is, what are you passionate about? Yeah. Well, thanks, Sarah. Look, I, I guess the most important thing I'm passionate about is action. And mm. of course, underpinning that is a passion for nature. I, have a, I grew up in rural Australia. I have a deep passion and connection with nature, but it goes deeper than that. I think it really is, you can sit in nature and enjoy yourself, but when you see bad things happening or you know damaging things happening to nature, I think my passion really is for action. I like doing things. I like getting out there and doing things, but from that place of, of, of belief, of, of a passion for nature, yeah. That's interesting because to, in a way they're like almost contradictory to me because nature is just, you know, being, and you're saying action, which to me makes me think of doing. So maybe explain, go a bit deeper into explaining what do you mean by action? Yeah. Well, I, I for me, it means when you see something and we, I know we're going to come on to this uh, later, but when you see something needs fixing, because something bad's happening to something you love and care for. I don't like sort of sitting sitting by. Mm. I get this intense, intense feeling that I've got to do something. I've got to do my part. I may not be able to solve the problem myself, but I've got to make my contribution. And and perhaps perhaps that's where the passion is. Maybe action is not the right word. This passion for contributing, passion mm. for doing something. And um my passion for nature runs deep uh, within me, and uh, and and when I and I include humans in that, you know, I, I don't. When mm -hmm. I, I think I am, I am nature, and your nature, we're all nature. So sometimes people assume when you talk about the environment versus social, they're two different things. Well, for me, they're not. When I think about nature, I think of humanity being included in that, and and the more than human world, all the rocks, all the plants, all the animals. All of the things that traditionally I'd learn at school is nature, which is painted as being somewhat separate from us, we humans. But I don't see it that way. You know, climate change is a great example where our actions have affected nature and ourselves so dramatically. Uh, and this is where it comes back to this question of, of doing something, of contributing. Got to do something, got to try and try and make a contribution in that space to make things better. Yeah. I can't help but thinking about Australia and probably not everybody because there's big cities as well, but I, I had a client who was also kind of from rural Australia and like this deep connection with nature. Do you think that's like, did you grow up in a family where everybody was connect more connected to nature than maybe we are over here? Or is that just a stereotype? Yeah, look, I, I think it probably is a bit of a stereotype. I, I grew up in a rural country town, which is now, big, it was only 30 miles out of Melbourne. And of course, the suburban sprawl has now gone right past mm, right. out into the rural areas where I used to just run, run and roam freely. And I had four dogs. We had a lot of animals, chickens and ducks and things like this. I was in an area where there were horses and cows and agriculture. Mm -hmm. and, and my family more or less, let me, my parents let me roam free. They So long as I came home at night and sat down at the dinner table and ate some dinner, they didn't really mind too much. Well, I don't know if they minded. I don't know if they noticed. <laughs> so I wasn't there. And it was just a wonderful opportunity for me. And some people might turn that around and say, oh, you know, oh, your parents didn't really care about you. Well, you know, when I bought jars of uh, redback spiders home for my mum that I'd caught during the day, she cared a lot then. And she'd get those spiders. <laughs> What's wrong with you? So, you know, it was just a great, I think it was a great uh, opportunity as a young boy to just go and explore and you know, look at frogs and tadpoles and all all the wildlife that exists in Australia, snakes, nasty spiders. I was surrounded by them all. And you find a connection to them and uh, and a respect for them, I think. And, and that's really infused my life. Yeah, I think that's really kind of what what's lost here, right? And, and I guess mostly also because a lot of us live in big cities. So there's 
not that possibility to, you know, be close to nature all the time, even though, you know, there's parks, but it feels like kind of a fake nature if you want because it's human made yeah. but, it generally safe places that's for sure i mean in australia you know i think i don't know what the figure is now but it, it's it's more than 80 percent of the population live in the cities you know melbourne mm-hmm. wow. sydney the big brisbane all the big cities and and there's this vast area inland from the coast where there's very few people uh, and there's a lot of nature well that said there's big agriculture too so the, the nature there has been you know put under the plow for example or you know changed through farming but yeah i think that you know i do think you're right i think in cities we we and of course not just in cities but lately i think lately the last 10 or so years we've all and where would we be now without Zoom in the middle of the pandemic? But these things are relatively recent. And so many young people, but people of our age, I don't want to say old people, Sarah, but <laughs> my age are starting. <laughs> yeah, certainly not you. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're getting more and more sedentary in a way. And I think we've got to be intentional to get up out of our chairs and go out and find ourselves a bit of nature. I mm. certainly try to every day, but I know a lot of people, you get overwhelmed with work, you commute into the office or or you just go home and you're at home with remote working and you go from the breakfast table to your desk, to lunch, to your desk and, and opportunities to get out are rare. And so I think we've got to be intentional about it and we've got to have that passion underpinning it to get us out there. Yeah, and, and really that's kind of the segue to what you uh, – are doing now and in a way your passion led to you know your business passion and and what you're doing now and getting people out of their chair and into the woods so tell us a bit uh more about that and your forest walks and all of that yeah no the for i i've always taken people i've been a lot of time in forests all, all my life you know back in 1999 when i started the forest trust that was a not for non-profit based in the uk trying to support companies to be more environmentally and socially responsible let's just say more responsible to the planet and 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 that work took me to places all around the world and i've been privileged to see so many different places and cultures and <clears throat> and natural environments but i left that in uh, 2019 the, the organization's going great guns and doing their thing but i wanted to look at sort of taking the lesson i the lessons that i'd learned sitting in the boardrooms of some pretty large companies with CEOs, some of the largest companies in the world, trying to help them find this different way of working in the world. And and one of the things that became clear to me was that I was able to do that when I was able to help those leaders get connected to who they were as people. When they were making decisions from their brain, which was usually things around profit and loss, brand value, quarterly results, KPIs, or you know all of those terms, work plans, budgets, everything became sort of pretty cold but when the ngos hung off their building like greenpeace saying you know you're destroying the world's forests Mm -hmm. and and things became pretty warm and actually pretty hot and and people got pretty (laughs) stressed and upset and and my job is to go in there and sort of help them find calm and say well do you really want to be linked to deforestation and the death of orangutans do you want to be linked to human rights abuses and of course the answer was always no but they didn't know how to find their way out and it wasn't for me to tell them because everyone's different but what it was for me was to help them find that connection where they said, we can do this, we, we can find a way out. And so I learned through that, that if we're going to get change in the world, it's not that we impose change on others. It's not that we make other people change because that doesn't work. We've got to inspire them to travel their own journey to a different place. And, and, and I found that I was able to do that when I was able to help them find calm, sometimes get them out in nature but certainly have them thinking about nature. You know, sometimes we're in the, you know, the top story of a large building somewhere in a big city in the world. You're a long way from nature. Mm-hmm. Getting to understand what's happening out there in the natural world was pretty critical. And so coming back to your question, a lot of what I'm doing now is trying to get people out there in nature so that they can find that calm. I, I find that when we go into nature, we, our mind starts to slow down. We and we start to feel things and we, we hear sounds, we smell things. You don't get a lot of the senses. You don't get a lot into your body when you're sitting behind your desk. You're just using sight and sound, really, very narrow range of senses. But when you're out in nature, you're seeing different things, you're smelling different things, you can touch things, you can even taste things if you're up for it. Um, you, you can really get into your body and you're walking, you're walking. And so, you know, your heart starts pumping, the blood starts working and your mind calms. And when that happens, 
my experience is some of that inner wisdom that we have can start being heard. It doesn't get drowned out by the whirring of our vastly intelligent brains. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we can find our way. We can find our way and say, right, this is what I need to do. Um, mm. Another part of it is, you know, you, you can't protect something. You, you don't protect things that you don't love. And so finding that connection with nature, I think, helps people to, to take action to protect it. Yeah, so much in there. Thanks for sharing that. I, for me, what it really is, I, I try to go on a daily walk uh, an hour or so, can't always do it. And sometimes it rains. It's rained a lot in Switzerland lately. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we, we usually get you know, some kind of break during the day. And that's when I rush out and I'm like, okay. And to me, really this, this notion of like, you, you, you mentioned your mind calms down and it calms down because nature just is, and there's nothing you need to change about it. Whereas entrepreneurs, we're always thinking, what do I change? What do I need to do? What do I need to improve? How do I make this work better? So our mind is constantly going, you know, a thousand miles per hour trying to solve things where in nature, it's just is. And most of the time it's beautiful. There's, you don't need to change anything. So I think, yeah, there's so much power in that. And, and like you mentioned a lot of people's lives maybe now a bit less with covid but even even so like you know if you were in a 9 to 5 job and now this 9 to 5 job has just been transferred to a home 9 to 5 job people still don't go out so it really is kind of a, a pushing yourself to go out there and just be in nature and and yeah and listen i, I feel like a big part of what you you are about but also what you help people do is is listen and you know just be quiet and then find the way to yourself i think you've hit the nail on the head sarah honestly I, you know my sense is you know, nature doesn't judge us you know we can go out yeah. there just be us we don't have to wear flash clothes we don't have to get dressed up for some important meeting where we feel pretty uncomfortable when we go out there we can just be us and i think this is the magic and and when we find our connection to ourselves is when we can start listening to that inner wisdom. And we've all got it. But it, I, I often talk about the hardest 50 or 60 centimetres. I'm a big, tall, thin fella. So for me, it's a bit of a 60 centimetre journey from, you know, from my brain <laughs> to my gut. So I measured it once just to try. You know, I imagine for some people it's a bit shorter or maybe even longer. But for me, it's about 60 centimetres from this whirring thing. And, and as you've mentioned, our brain gets swamped with so many information sources someone says you should do this another one says you should do that another one says you're not doing this right another one says you are and <laughs> you know you've got to start making judgments about the right way to go and of course some of these things can be hugely conflictual and confusing and we get stuck and so what i try and do is try and help people and and this is you know you mentioned taking people out in the forest you know these forest therapy walks and things like this it's all about just slowing down turning the mind off and for me getting them from their brain down into the well for me it's the, the the gut i always point to my belly button that's where i think the wisdom lies and unfortunately for some people there's a bit of a steel reinforced concrete block sitting around their their chest level and they just can't get there because they're so programmed to be in their brain that you know the brain you know i think therefore i am you know it's been a big philosophy i think that's caused humans a lot of problems we we don't feel things i often say to people feel th- feel feel first then think Like, how does it feel? Is there resonance there? Mm -hmm. Does it feel okay that you're being linked to human rights abuses, that you're linked to the death of orangutans? How does that feel? Well, it Mm -hmm. doesn't feel real good. And where are you feeling it? Well, you're not feeling it up here in your head. You're feeling it in your body. It feels there's shame, there's judgment there. You don't want to talk to your mum about it. You know, these are bad things. So go with that feeling. And once you go with that feeling, then engage your, your powerful brain. Like, we need our brains to make work plans, to to make procedures, to give action. So it's not that we're, I'm saying, let's not use our brain, but take it away from primacy. Put the primacy down into your more feeling, bodily feeling, that inner wisdom inside, that connection to your values and who you are as a person and act from that place. And my experience is that that can bring huge change. It can bring extraordinary performance to to a business. I know that, you know, that's, that's an important thing for us entrepreneurs. It's not that 
it, and some people say, oh, it's all spiritual nonsense. You know what? When you're dealing with the world's largest food company in Nestle, the world's largest palm oil company, and you sit with people and, and you mentioned it, most of my work is listening, letting people find their way to their own connection and operating from there. They need someone to listen to them. And when you see them connect to that, whoosh, off they go. And they bring so much power of their budgets, of their, you know, of their bottom lines. They've got a lot of resources. When they say, we don't want to be linked to something, watch out. These are the people you need to motivate, but they need to be motivated from themselves, not from someone wagging their finger at them and giving them judgment that tends to have them scurrying in the opposite direction. Yeah. I want to just bring it back also to marketing because what you just mentioned about, you know, people, how they bring in the feelings. I often say that also in, in marketing for until now, we've always addressed only the left brain in our marketing message and communications, but it is so important that we also address the right brain of people. So really create marketing material that is beautiful, whimsical, uh, and addresses feelings because people nowadays, conscious clients, customers, they are no longer only, you know, making buying decisions with their left brain. You know, does this work? How much does it cost? Uh, how long is it, et cetera. But they're also starting to think, well, how is it going to make me feel? Does it feel good if I buy this product? If it, Does it feel good if I work with this person? Are our values aligned? All these kind of bigger picture questions, right? Absolutely spot on. And, and, you know, what happens with people when they're working in a situation where their values aren't aligned, they're going to work every day thinking, God, you know, this is not who I am. Stress levels start to go up, you know, all sorts of illnesses creep in. I talk about the well-being ladder. They start falling down this ladder. They, they, they start getting to burn out pretty quickly because they're just not being who they are. And you can't, that's a place of dissonance. Yeah. We need to find a place of resonance. So, you know, on, on, on the downside of the marketing is when companies say all these grand things because they're the cliches of the day, everyone's yeah. got to be carbon zero. And then in practice, they're not doing anything about it. Then the people who work for the company who care about these issues start feeling that dissonance and they start saying, hold on a minute, there's a bit of greenwashing or we could use other words starting with B and S that, you know, that's that doesn't resonate with who I am. And they yeah. start geez, should I be working for this company? So all of those things kick in. And, and this is why we see, I think increasingly, as people are starting to understand that climate change, ocean plastics, pollution, human rights abuses are a very real and very large part of life. They don't want to be associated with those things. So they're looking for the leaders of the companies that they work for. The leaders themselves are looking to set clear direction and then implement those things. And any you set them and then any marketing that, you know, makes a little bit of story out of it that's different from reality, you quickly get called out. And that dissonance that it creates can affect your performance very dramatically. So, you know, the key thing that I always say to people is, who are you? Don't worry about what your customers are asking for. Who are you? And 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 speak from that place and act from that place. So I come back to action. Act from there. And people will start saying, we can trust those people. We'll, we'll buy their products or we'll buy their services because they seem to have it together. I love that you're saying that because that that so much in the marketing world, you know, over the past 10 years, I've heard it over and over and over again, you know, focus on your uh, target audience, your persona. And, and so I've chased after this, you know, ideal client for so many years without first paying attention to who I was. And so there was a huge misalignment because, well, eventually, you know, you just kind of crumble because you're wearing this mask for all this time, pretending to be someone you're not. And so that's why it's so important to bring more of you to your marketing and bring your values and, and bring your passions. And, and if, you know, if that's, you know, forest walks, talk about that. I think that the world is ready for you to be more open uh, about, you know, your passions. And it's not true that people don't care about you. There was this message also in the marketing world saying that people don't care about you. They just care about how you help them or they care about themselves. I don't think that's true. I, I think people don't care about how much money you make or, you know, what kind of titles you have and, you know, all your success stories. Maybe they don't care much about that, but they care about you as a human being and they want to see that 
you are aligned with their values. That's what they care about. I, I just can't agree more strongly with you, Sarah. I, you know, people I've sat in, in dark rooms over many years with the CEOs and leaders and leadership teams of companies. And, and people say, oh, how did you do it? How did you bring them to change? Well, it wasn't just me. There was a whole ecosystem of change. But I sometimes just provided that little drop of pixie dust on the top. And, and what it was, was, you know, their heads were spinning. They were going crazy as they were getting beaten up by the NGOs. And I was the guy that went in there and just sat quietly and listened. And I've been screamed at. I've been yelled at. Why? Not because they hated me, because Greenpeace wasn't in the room you know, or Mighty Earth wasn't in the room. The NGO wasn't there. So I had to scream at someone. Yeah. And, and I was the guy that took it. I had to clean my glasses because, you know, when people really <laughs> scream at you, all the stuff comes out. And I was like, excuse me, hold on. I said, carry on. Let me just clean my glass. You know, you've got to be able to cope with that. And so when people say to me, how do we bring change? I'm like, just be yourself. Just go into that room and be yourself. Because after a while, when they've screamed at you four times and you're still there and you're smiling and you're saying, yeah, look, I hear you, they start calming down and they're saying, we can trust this person. You know, this person isn't judging us and, and we can find a way forward. So I think in terms of inspiring people to be the best they can be in the world, um, we have all we need. We don't need grand qualifications. We just need to be ourselves. But for that, you've got to be connected to yourself. You've got to know who you are. And that's where the work is. The work is not in a lot of great to have qualifications. You know, it's great. We learn a lot of knowledge, but that's not the work. Mm. The work is to understand who you are as a person and and to live from that place as often as you can. That brings me to this great picture you have on your website of a of a man. It's like a cartoon, a man praying to a duck. And I think it has something to do with, with that, right? So take us yeah. there. Yeah, it does. So I'm very lucky. I grew up in Australia and we have a cartoonist. He's, he's more a philosopher, really, called Michael Looney. And um, a bit of a controversial character sometimes. And I think a lot of his work, and he does a lot of whimsy and things like this. And sometimes he even says, I don't even know what this cartoon's about, but I felt <laughs> I need to draw it. Um, and I love that. But many of his, much of his work is, is has deep meanings behind it. And I grew up with it over, you know, he's 76, I think now. I've listened to, I've looked at his cartoons for many years. And back in 1990, he published a book of prayers, which many people thought was very strange and out of character because um, he never struck anyone as being particularly religious. Mm -hmm. and, and he was actually forced to explain that it's not about religion, though it's about the act of praying and the act of connection to something deep within you. And what was interesting, and I actually, and he wrote this beautiful introduction to explain this picture that he had of, of, of a man. I, I prefer to call it a person now to be make sure that I'm politically correct. But Very good, talks, yes. Talks about it as being a man. But, but you know, it's, it's a person praying to a duck. And, and I, just before we came on, I, I, I just opened the, the text. And I, this is a little paragraph. It says, the duck in the picture symbolizes one thing and many things, nature, instinct, feeling, beauty, innocence, the primal, the non-rational, and the mysterious unsayable. Qualities we can easily attribute to a duck <laughs> and qualities which coincidentally and remarkably we can easily attribute to the inner life of the kneeling man, to his spirit or his soul. The duck then in this picture can be seen as a symbol of the human spirit and in wanting connection with his spirit, it is a symbolic picture of a man searching for his soul. Mm. And this just, I was a young lad, well, younger lad when I read this the first time and it just, just connected with me completely. And he goes on to say that it's a lifetime struggle to try and get close to the duck, to get connected to that duck. And, and of course, it's a lot easier uh, sometimes to talk to people about ducks than it is to talk about their soul. And you start going into a room of business people and start talking about souls and, oh, hold on, this is weird. <laughs> you know, they get a bit freaked out. Let's talk about ducks. <laughs> uh, okay, that's much easier in principle. And he talks about it being a lifetime struggle. But what's interesting is he also talks about it being a social and political act in the sense that the searcher influences those around them. And this has been my experience. If you can live you know, as truly as you can. And we never, we never get there a hundred percent. You know, we always fail somewhere along the way we stumble, but if we can get as connected to it as we can, we influence those around us to strive to do the same. And I, and I think when people said, you know, how did you get, you know, Nestle to sign a no deforestation commitment? Well, 
I just went in there as myself and, and, and that inspired them to be themselves. We, we developed trust. Same with the palm oil companies that I worked with, the pulp and paper companies. It took longer for some. There had to be a lot of trust built in a place where there wasn't trust. But when they found that connection, it was like, stand back. They went for it. And my job is just to you know be there with them. So I think that there is much to be said in any job, anything we do to find this connection to yourself. And if we can live our life from that place, we can inspire many things. And that includes great bottom lines on, on company uh, balance sheets because people want to work with people like that. So mm-hmm. you're right. You're right. Let's, you know, if we can focus more on those, you know, who we are as people, I always say to people, you are going out there into the world, looking for a needle in the haystack with your marketing. You're looking for the client, the perfect client. Well, what if you're the, what if you're the needle in the haystack? What if you're the thing that your clients need to find? Well, they need to know who you are. They need to know what this needle looks like. And, and this needle that I'm looking at is a Sarah shaped needle, <laughs> you know, and I can see the outer Sarah. Sure. It's not a duck. <laughs> not that ducky look about you, but you know, <laughs> it is, you know, I need to know if I'm going to work with you. And, and I've been fortunate enough that I have got to know you not, not completely, but I, I know that what's inside Sarah's outer shell, things that align with what's inside me. So I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to Sarah. I'll yeah. be interested to hear what she's got to say. I trust her. Exactly. So I think, you know, understand that you're the needle in the haystack, not your perfect client. Turn it around. Let, yeah. let Be yourself and they will find you. Love it. Yeah. And I got to say, I really love this idea of the duck. It, it makes some really deep talk very playful. And like you said, you can bring it up in a corporate setting or you can you know, because sometimes this is kind of like heavy. And, and for me as a Capricorn, I'm also just like very grounded and very pragmatic. And, and so sometimes if you, if someone takes me too far up into, you know, up there, I'm like, I like the idea of a duck. It really does work for me. Yeah. And I say to people, you know, what's your animal? My animal just sort of by, by default became a duck because I read this when I was so young. Yeah. And I, we had it could duck. be any. Can, it could, yeah. Well, what's your animal? I've got a, fellow that I work with, his is a chamois, uh, mm. the little goat that lives up in the mountains. That's what he uh, that's what he feels is yeah. the voice inside him. I'm like, go for it. Let yourself yeah. go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's beautiful. I'm trying to kind of bring it back together and come full circle. And, and the question that comes up is like, well, how does this all matter? Uh, and we already kind of hinted at it, but how does this matter for us as entrepreneurs, yes, you know, we mentioned, yes, we need to bring more of us into our marketing, but as entrepreneurs, our business is our life uh, and our life is our business. So I, I feel like it impacts much more than your marketing. I'd like to hear your take on it. I think it impacts everything. I, my experience with running the TFT was uh, we put our values front and center and, and we, we, we grappled every day with the challenge of living true to them. Um, as I say, we didn't always make it, but we never failed spectacularly to the point where people would say, oh, you're greenwashing dodgy so-and-sos. Mm-hmm. I think people always got the sense that we were striving to live according to our values. And our values were truth, respect, courage, compassion, and humility. And we had a coat of arms that was our business plan that was in all of our offices around the world. And this bound our teams together together. You can't achieve great results in any company, even if you're a manufacturing company and you've got robots doing all the manufacturing for you. Someone's got to program the robots and maybe in time that won't be necessary, but somewhere along the way we need people. And those people, you need good people. So, you know, my experience is, you know, I would go out and I would talk about TFT and it became dangerous because every time I did that and talked about the things that we were doing and the values and the way we acted, we'd get about 20 CV submissions of people wanting to come and work with us. We only mm-hmm. had maybe one or two jobs or none at the time. Right. And get another 50 companies saying, we'd like to work with you as well. Yeah. Um, and, and so what happened over, over a long period is we, not initially because I think people weren't sure and they thought this was all a bit weird. This was, you know, back in 1999. I think it would be, it's more acceptable now, but it just became our greatest, our greatest pillar, if you like. Everything was anchored around this way of being and people wanted to work for us and we got the brightest and best candidates coming to work for us and then we could just set them free and say go for it go and do this work which meant that we were able to take our operations to scale 
so much more dramatically. And we weren't a company, an organ, a nonprofit that could rely on technology. We relied on trust building face to face with people from business leaders all the way down to communities out living, indigenous people living in the forests of Africa. We had to build trust with them. And I think it goes the same for any business. So if you can act from that place, people can read you. Most people, my fundamental belief uh, is that most people are pretty good. And when, and when you take off those masks that we talked about earlier, those veneers of trying to pretend to be something you're not, people can see through that. And when you take that off, behind most people, even if they've been traumatized and had bad experiences through their lives, deep down inside, there's good people, there's good in everyone. And if you act from that place, people can read you and they want to work with you. You become their needle in the haystack. And there's a lot of people looking, looking for needles uh, in haystacks and you become the bright, you know, you, you, you raise your torch and people see the light above the horizon and say, I'm going there. I want to work. I don't even know who they are, but I've heard a lot and I see that light. I want to be, I want to be associated with that. Yeah. I think it, and I don't talk about, you know, life, you know, professional and personal life, business life and personal life. I just talk about life. Yeah. I think the mission for all of us is to live truly to who we are and then great things will unfold. Beautiful. I love that. Yeah. I think, like you said, it applies to, to anything. It applies to your personal relationships and your business relationships and, and, you know, beyond that. So, yeah, this is really, really good. Thank you so much, Scott. I, I want to ask you to share where people can find out more about you. We haven't even had time to talk about your My Carbon Zero uh, project. We'll have to do another episode on that. Happy to do um, that. That's kind of a separate topic. And, and so, yeah, let's reconnect for that. But tell us you know, about your company a different way and where people can find you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Now, well, if people just Google Scott Poynton, they'll generally find my my website, which is just scottpoynton.com, and I talk about a different way there. Like all websites, it needs a bit of um, updating and things like that, but it's all pretty much there. And um, and uh, as you say, I've, I've set up an initiative called My Carbon Zero to try and inspire people to take climate action. That's just mycarbonzero.org. It's, it's a new foundation that I've set up here in Switzerland. Part of my problem is I've got too many things going on. <laughs> That's the Pond Foundation. I told you you're passionate. <laughs> it's like you. Exactly. Yeah. The, the Pond Foundation, which is where My Carbon Zero sits, is it's really, I think it's after many years, it's the culmination of this idea that when I was a young kid, I used to, my place of sanctuary was a pond and that's where you could go and find calm. So, you know, calm mm. and chaos. That's one element of the Pond Foundation. And that was the, the lesson that I found when I was sitting in those dark rooms um, with the leaders of these companies. Give them calm and they'll find their way to a better mm. place. But it's also this idea of a ripple. When you drop, a, mm. you drop a stone into a pond, it sends these ripples out. And I think we need to do that. So that's the Pond Foundation, pondfoundation.org. But we do have My Carbon Zero as a key initiative there. And then a different way is really just more or less what I'm talking about. Turn things on their head and, and spend your life trying to be you as opposed to trying to be something else for someone else. And I think if you can do that, your well-being will spiral to wonderful heights. All of those around you will benefit from the joy of being with you. And that includes your business partners, the people who work for you, your investors, and your clients. It seems to me to be the way to great success, a happy life, and doing something useful for the planet. I love it. Amazing. I always ask one last question, Scott, and that's what are you grateful for today or this week? I'm grateful uh, for the breath in my lungs and just grateful to still be here. Uh, there's a lot of people who aren't and um, st still going for it, still seeing what can be done to, uh, to, to bring, you know, to bring things into a better place. So yeah. And grateful to be talking to you, Sarah. Likewise. Yeah. Until we meet again. Good on you. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on to the show. Appreciate it. Did you enjoy this conversation? Would you have loved to join us uh, somewhere in the forest as well and just, you know, listen? You'll find the show notes of this episode with further links at humane.marketing forward slash HM100. Still have to get used to the new domain name. There's no .com, so the 
the dot is marketing. So humane.marketing forward slash HM100. And Scott also sent me a picture of the person and the duck so you can uh, see what we were thinking of when talking about this. And I really just, I love the simplicity of this um, image and the depth and the meaning of it. You can find out more about Scott on his site, scottpoyton.com, or on his website, mycarbonzero.org. So as I said, we didn't have time to get into that, but it's definitely something that I'm really interested in. And I just recently did my carbon footprint analysis. And looking at it, it's um, a lifetime liabilities of 233 uh, I think that's tons of CO2 that I, um, you know, have created over a lifetime and that I'm planning to slowly, um, yeah, minimize, obviously, for the future going further, but also, you know, invest in some of uh, Scott's projects that help actually reduce the carbon footprint because it's not no longer enough to, you know, go lower in the future but we actually have to go backwards and reinvest in forests and reinvest in in things that reduce all the carbon the uh, co2 that we have produced already that being said um if you'd like to join a hive mind of humane marketers who care, who care about things like nature, who care about finding out who we are, who care about carbon zero and those kind of things, and who get together on a monthly call to discuss humane marketing and business questions, then don't miss our next circle call, which is coming up next Wednesday, September 8th. We co-create, we collaborate, we share ideas, we listen and speak with intention. You can find out more at humane.marketing forward slash circle. And in next week's episode, I talk to Thomas Broker, a German business owner and an empath in business. And that's going to be about personal power. So tune back in next week. Thank you so much for listening and being part of a generation of marketers who truly cares for yourself, your clients, and the planet. We are change makers before we are marketers. Go be the change you want to see in the world. Yay, I'm so happy for my new tagline at the end. I was getting tired of repeating uh, the same old you know, be the change uh, you want to see in the world. So now I have a new one that says we are change makers before we are marketers. Go be the change you want to see in the world. Until we speak again, take care.